Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Virtual Transplant Journey 2024. This next session is transplant nutrition, pre and post transplant. And I put a few housekeeping items in the chat already this morning. So if you can refer to that, if you have anything, any questions, but um, questions for the speaker for Christine today, will go in the Q&A tab. Um, and we will share those with her after the presentation as time allows. Christine Hare, our next speaker here, is a registered dietitian and certified renal specialist with over 20 years of experience in renal nutrition. She worked for 14 years at the UMMC transplant program and currently teaches kidney smart classes to patients with CKD, educating on nutrition and modality options, including transplant. She is the chair of Maryland, the Maryland Delaware chapter of the National Kidney Foundation. Please welcome Christine Hare. Thanks, Rachel. Welcome, everybody. I hope you're having a great conference so far. So, getting started, Rachel already told you a lot of this, so I don't have to go through too much in depth. But again, I'm Christine Hare, uh, and I do. I like for the. For years, I worked at UMMC at the transplant program uh, and currently do teach uh, pre-dialysis kidney education classes. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, just some pictures, my my dog, a uh, little bit. My, I'm originally from Western New York, hence the, the buffalo wear. So before we get into the content, I want to know a little bit about who's here today. Uh, so Rachel's going to launch just a couple quick polls just so I can see where everyone kind of is in part of this transplant journey. So the first one, just let me know if you're pre-transplant, post-transplant, or maybe a family member just here for support today. And we'll give you a couple seconds to answer. Well, I see the results, Rachel. Uh, yep, go ahead. So um, I can share them with everybody. Oh, awesome. Do you see oh, that? Good. So, yes, yeah, so we got a really good mix. There's an even mix pretty much of the pre-post pre and family member. Very cool. And then the next poll, just want to know what organ type. So is it kidney or liver, heart, lung, pain? Oh, that's the poll three. Sorry. <laughs> Out of order. <laughs> So which kind of organ did you have transplanted or are you waiting to receive? And I know some of you can be both. So I didn't, I wouldn't put that as an option. So just pick whichever one you like better. <laughs> you know, sometimes we've got some new dual transplants. And I apologize if you guys done a poll like this already today, but I, I always like to see who I'm speaking to. All right. Can you see those now? Yeah. Okay. So definitely kid, kidney and liver. I feel like that's a the pretty eaten mix where we had the most the last time too. And we got a little bit of one. So very cool. Thanks guys. So I always enjoy just seeing where, where you guys are with the transplant journey. So great to know. So with that, let's get started. I'm going to get into the content. Why is it not advancing? There we go. So I kind of came up with a theme when I was kind of making, I want to go back. Um, when I was kind of coming up with my presentation this spring, it happened to be spring training. I don't know. I, I'm guessing most of you are in Maryland, uh, but I'm a big Orioles fan. So I, I think I had baseball in my mind when I was making this a little bit. So my kind of theme for today is how to hit a home run with transplant nutrition. Uh, so just some common themes we'll talk about. My ba you'll all have some corny baseball anal analogies. I'll warn you ahead of time, but we're going to take it one base at a time. You know, with anything health wise, including transplant, it's a big deal. So sometimes it can seem a little overwhelming, uh, but if we take it one day at a time or one base at a time, uh, that can be really helpful in, in getting us to be in a successful place. So some big pieces that we'll talk about today is just for those of you that are still pre-transplant, really optimizing your pre-transplant nutrition, because this is what's going to really get you ready 
to for your procedure, for your transplant to be successful with it. Uh, we'll talk about nutrition for healing. Uh, then post-transplant, healthy living with your transplant. How can we make you be successful? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about food safety, different foods to avoid, and just the importance of working with your healthcare team. So why, why do we include nutrition in this conference today? Uh, as a dietitian, I obviously value the importance of nutrition, and I've seen how I can really directly impact patients so much, both before and after the transplant. So some things that we think about with nutrition, I think, you know, when most people talk about like a dietitian, they think that dietitians, they put you on a diet. And I, I've always never loved that connotation because I think we often think of diet as a negative where nutrition is really a positive. It's, it's, it's helping fuel your body for whatever phase you might be in. And with transplant, both pre-transplant, post-transplant, there are so many nuances when it comes to nutrition. So from a pre-transplant phase. Uh, why we care so much about it is that nutrition, as well as your functional status, really, really impacts your outcome. Uh, it's the post-operative healing is, is so, so important with any surgery. And let's face it, having an organ transplant, it's a big operation. Uh, and proper nutrition really can help expedite that healing process. Parts of that we'll talk about a little bit more, just focusing on adequate protein intake, if you have diabetes or if your blood sugars are maybe running a little higher than normal post-operatively focusing on that blood sugar management and also just keeping your electrolytes in balance. So those are some things kind of in that immediate post-operative and in the few weeks post-transplant that you're really going to be focusing more on. And then long-term health. The whole reason we want to have an organ transplant is to lead a long and healthy life. Uh, so Again, fueling our body in a, a positive way can help really encourage that long-term health. So some things that we may be considering, uh, weight management, whether it might be losing a little weight to get to a healthier weight, or for if you're underweight, getting your weight back up to a weight where you, you've got a little bit of reserve. Also, disease-specific management. Uh, you know, when that initial poll where we're asking which organ type you have, everyone is in a different place. There's, you know, it's, it definitely can be a different nutrition focus for someone that's had a kidney transplant versus someone that's had a lung transplant. Uh, and, you know, someone with a kidney disease may have other conditions. It's not just the kidneys. They may have diabetes or high blood pressure. So definitely a lot of disease-specific management goes into that, too. Uh, and then, of course, transplant specific guidelines. Uh, you guys are probably pretty familiar with this, but with a kidney transplant, you're on transplant specific medications like the immunosuppressants, which can affect you know, certain things that we eat. Uh, so definitely really important to take that into account. So preparing for your transplant. I, I couldn't resist this little picture of the little leaguer. So I, I, I thought this was kind of almost like this is our training. This is whether it's spring training or your minor leagues or when you're starting to, to learn to play your sport. Um, that's kind of that preparing for your transplant phase. So what I had like, kind of mentioned earlier, really focusing on optimizing that nutrition and your functional status. When it comes to what you should be eating, again, Everyone is going to be a little bit different. Uh, I find that for not everybody, but for most people, uh, even with you know the the different organ types, whether your heart, lung, liver, kidney, uh, oftentimes for many people they are to be on a lower sodium diet. Uh, so that if, if that's something that's indicated for you, that's often a really big focus. So watching that salt intake can be really important and also a little bit challenging. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later today. This is another big one, maintaining an appropriate protein intake. Protein is a building block for our body. So it's a big deal. Uh, depending on what your organ type is and what other things you might be going through, that can really influence how much protein you need. One example that I use, and this is coming from, I guess, my view as a, a mainly a kidney dietitian, you do see people that if they are pre-dialysis and they are looking to get ready for a kidney transplant, it's a little challenging because you want to optimize that nutrition, but we we also don't want you to go overboard with protein intake because too much protein can be more impactful on the kidneys when someone is not on dialysis yet. 
where it's a totally different thing if you are preparing for your kidney transplant and you are already on dialysis because your protein needs are much, much higher at that point. Um, with liver disease, also often more proteins indicated as well. With anything, I always encourage you to, to work with your dietitian, whether it's at your transplant center uh, or if you are, for example, on dialysis, your dialysis dietitian, to really see like how much protein should I be getting in to maintain my health and also to help kind of prepare me for my organ transplant. Also electrolytes, you know, adjusting is needed uh, with kidney disease in specific. Sometimes they have to be mindful of potassium and phosphorus intake. Uh, I also see a lot of times, you know, with many organ types, sometimes there's, you may be taking a fluid pill, something like a furosemide or a Lasix that can really cause you to lose potassium and magnesium. So kind of knowing your numbers, working with your team to find out, is there something that I need more of to keep me in that healthy range? And of course, maintaining or striving for a healthy weight for yourself, uh, whether it's, again, it's it might be losing a little bit of weight to help decrease that risk of post-operative wound complications, or it may be gaining some weight if you're a little underweight. You know, we, we want people to have, I use the term, a little bit of reserve uh, going into a surgery, because if someone's really, really underweight, and then after their surgery, they're not eating, there's a really high risk for malnutrition. Uh, so, so definitely a lot to consider there. And also just staying as active as you are able to. Uh, improved functional status really, really can impact your recovery after a transplant. So trying to be as active as you can can be a wonderful thing. As always, working with your team, whether it's your transplant team dietitian, your physician, to help you understand what nutrition guidelines are best for you. Uh, nutrition and diet can be a really confusing thing because you hear a lot, in, whether it's in social media, uh, on the Today Show, and, and sometimes what nutrition trends are big in the overall country may not be the best what's right for you as you work towards a transplant. So again, always work with your team to figure out where you need to be. I love this plate. I, I think kind of a baseline for, for most people, wherever we might be, uh, oftentimes kind of looking at your plate and really focusing on that vegetable and fruit intake can be such a good thing, getting some lean protein in, some carbs for energy. So I've always liked this example of a kind of a, a nice plate and then, of course, individualize that. So back to that functional status piece, this is something I really did see a lot in, in patients, you know, when they were working through the transplant process, those that were kind of in better physical condition going in really rebounded much more quickly from the transplant. And this can be tough. You know, a lot of times when we're getting closer to the point where we need a transplant, I find that the energy level is one of the first things that may really be impacted. You may not have a lot of energy to exercise. That's tough. Uh, also with a lot of different organ transplants, sometimes the fluid status can be affected where many people may be retaining fluid. And it's a lot harder to walk around and move around if you're carrying 10, 15 pounds of fluid weight on you. So there's a lot of things that are kind of maybe working against the idea of regular exercise and someone that's working towards an organ transplant. So doing what you can do. Uh, if you are feeling that you are physically deconditioned, I am a huge proponent of physical therapy. Um, so asking your primary care doctor or your transplant team for a referral, if you feel like your strength is not there, the physical therapist can really kind of meet you where you are and maybe give you some good, really good functional exercises to increase your strength. I think a lot of times when we think of exercise, we think it has to be 30 minutes all at once. Just meet yourself where you are and, and see, can I improve on that? Uh, walking is always, I think, a, a really good exercise because it's good for both. It's, you're using your muscles. You're also kind of working your heart, your lungs, your cardiovascular system. So that if that's something you're able to do, uh, I think just kind of seeing what your baseline is and maybe trying to increase your steps a little bit. Sometimes they say just increase by a thousand steps a day uh, to a goal somewhere between seven to 10,000. And research has been shown to be a good goal for a lot of people. Uh, if you don't have a step counter, not a problem. Just kind of start where you are and maybe trying to add five or 10 minutes. And maybe for the whole week, it might be somewhere between 150 and 300 minutes of walking. And that might be way too much for you too. So kind of see where you are and just incremental goals. I know that sometimes with walking, especially if you're having any shortness of breath, uh, if you're having 
uh, you know, any like joint pain, walking's not the best exercise for some people. Uh, if it's more joint pain, if you have access to a pool, swimming can be wonderful. And resistance training, things like exercise bands, chair exercises. This again is where, you know, a good physical therapist can really give you good functional exercises to get that strength up. Uh, so definitely the stronger you are going into surgery, like I said, it really does help with those post-operative outcomes. And mindfulness matters too. Let's face it, going through you know, an illness, going through an organ transplant process, that can be a lot of stress. And I think that sometimes some of those mindful exercises, things like meditation, yoga, whether it's you know a traditional class or more of a chair yoga or something like Reiki can really be helpful. And, and getting our mind right, just finding that piece uh, can be helpful in getting our whole body strong before a transplant. So post-operatively, so here we are, we've, we've reached the major leagues, we are in the real deal, we have gotten our transplant. So we need to see what can we do to, to start racking up those base hits here. So one of the big ones immediately post-transplant is focusing on your protein intake. A uh, couple of reasons for that. Protein is really, really important to heal our bodies. Two things, kind of that physical, like what you actually see after a transplant, you of course will have a surgical wound. So our bodies need more protein to help with that wound closure. We want to get that wound healed as soon as possible because anytime that wound is lingering open, it really increases that risk of wound infection. So definitely that optimal nutrition is vital. Also, you know, you after any kind of surgery, truly even during a lot of hospitalizations, even without a surgery, our body becomes in what we call a catabolic state where our muscles being broken down. Uh, you've probably seen this, whether it's for those of you that are post-transplant, you know, if you had your surgery uh, or just any of you, if you've ever been in the hospital for a few days, you, you tend to, you lose muscle mass quickly. Uh, and so with that, again, we need to really make sure we're ensuring to get our calories and our adequate protein in to help with that healing inside and out. If you have diabetes, uh, really important to be properly managed with that. Uh, for those of you, like, you know, even some of you that might not have diabetes, sometimes after the stress of a surgery, your blood sugars may run up a little bit. Uh, also, not everyone with the prednisone, that's not, you know, not everyone gets prednisone after transplant anymore, but some people, even if they're not going to be in on long term, may get it initially. And pr prednisone can definitely increase those sugar levels also in people with diabetes and also even non diabetics. Uh, and again, we want to control those sugars because another thing that if your blood sugars are out of control, it truly impacts that wound healing. So, really key and just consistent carbohydrate intake. Uh, balance electrolyte thing as imbalances. Uh, this is also, you know, this changes a lot. Your body went through a lot. Uh, we see a lot in transplant sometimes that the magnesium and phosphorus levels may get low. Potassium is variable. Some people it's totally normal. Others may see a little bit of low potassium, particularly if you, you may be on a fluid pill after. Uh, also, you see some people where they're the potassium is retained a little bit. Some of the medicines can cause that. So you may, some people do still have to limit potassium after a transplant. So just again, working with your team to know what do I need more of? What do I need less of? In that immediate post-operative time that the team will be managing a lot of that. But as you're getting closer to discharge and going home, really important that you know too. And then hydration, adequate hydration, very vital after a transplant. And this can be a big change. I, I find this especially for people that were on in-center hemodialysis prior to a kidney transplant, you usually are in a pretty strict fluid restriction. So to go from 32 to 40 ounces of fluid to we want you to drink as much water as humanly possible, uh, it, it can be a big change for a lot of people. So again, working with your team to know how much hydration do I need uh, and definitely choosing lower calorie beverages. Water is always going to be our, our number one option. So when we're focusing on that adequate calorie and protein intake, again, work with your team. You know, when you're inpatient in the hospital, you know, there's a dietitian that usually will be rounding. And then post-transplant, you should have access to a dietitian as well. I'm also a huge proponent of understanding your lab work the best you can. Uh, typically, you know, after a transplant, you're you're getting your blood work done pretty regularly. Uh, and I know sometimes you will get a printout of that, or a lot of you probably access, you know, your, your patient portal, uh, 
And I really encourage that. You know, I've had patients where they they track their labs. They have like Excel spreadsheets. Some of them just write it down in a notebook, whatever might work for you. But kind of knowing kind of some of those key labs that the doctors are looking at, and you can look at those too. And that way you're just more invested in your health and you know the questions to ask. So that is a huge piece of it. Uh, for those of you that, you know, post-operatively, sometimes your appetite's not the greatest, especially right when you're in the hospital. Let's face it, hospital food, I think, has come a long way, but it's still not home cooking. Uh, so if, if that's a struggle, you know, in the hospital, sometimes you can ask for, uh, they have kind of like your, I find like people sometimes do better with getting just like some chicken salad or some tuna salad uh, versus like a hot meal sometimes tastes a little better. Uh, once you're home, you know, when you're trying to get those calories in, if you feel like your appetite's not up to par, healthy fats are actually a great way to, to boost your calorie intake because fats have about nine calories per gram. So they're definitely a higher caloric density. These things like protein and carbohydrates are about four calories per gram. Some of my favorite good fats, things like olive oil, avocado oil, and those are really easy to incorporate, you know, whether you're making like a salad dressing, a marinade, you know, adding it to popcorn, uh, cooking your chicken in it. So it's, it's something you can easily add. And, you know, one tablespoon of oil is about 100 calories. So it can add up quickly when you're trying to boost that caloric intake. Fatty fish, something like salmon, also a wonderful choice. Gets a double dose. You get the protein as well as that healthy fat. And then adding in mini meals, snacks as needed. You Again, your appetite may not be 100%. So you sometimes it might not be where you might not be able to eat that big full meal all at once. So just maybe doing little snacks throughout the day, adding in, again, and focusing on what you need. If you're needing more protein, if you're need, needing more caloric density, kind of see what do I need more of and just trying to eat more often throughout the day. If your appetite's not the greatest, eat your protein first to make sure you're getting that in. Uh, some people will may need like protein supplements to, to boost that intake. There's so much on the market. There's protein bars, shakes, powders. Again, work with your team to maybe find what's the most appropriate for you. Uh, if you're needing protein, Protein and calories, it may be something like a higher calorie, something like a you know an Ensure Plus, where you're getting the protein plus the calories. Uh, if maybe you know you're you're good with the calories, but you really need the protein, it might be more of like a protein powder that you could mix in to like your oatmeal or into like a an unsweetened almond milk. Uh, so kind of figuring out what you are needing and and working with your team is always essential to doing that. Sometimes even just really functional adding in protein, you know, eggs are one of the most easy, complete proteins we have. The white of the egg is where the protein is. So sometimes just even adding, you know, whether it's the whole egg or adding the chopped up egg white to something like a tuna salad or a chicken salad is a great way to get a little bit of extra protein in there if you need it. Some other things, you know, when we're looking at just overall, like, a, for example, we think of like healthy eating, healthy weight, uh, you really want a healthy weight for you. You know, it's it's not, you know, a lot of times with transplant, I know they, they talk about things like body mass index, uh, you know, in that pre-transplant and post-transplant process. And it's it's a number. It's a way to, to be, you know, healthcare, we're all about numbers. So we use that. But sometimes, you know, you might not be the perfect BMI, but if you're at a healthy, stable weight for you, that can be good. So working with your team to kind of figure out what that may be. Uh, focusing on small changes. Uh, sometimes, you know, I think with when it's transplant, especially, it's kind of like, we're like, oh my gosh, I have this whole new lease on life. Sometimes there's a, you know, like, I want to be perfect with all of this. I want to treat my new organ as well as possible. And that is really important. I also, you know, for as a dietitian, I find that people usually do better with kind of like smaller kind of gradual changes versus a complete overhaul of what they're eating. Some people are able to do that, but just, you know, again, it may be little changes. You might not be perfect all the time, but those small changes can go a long way in keeping you and your organ healthier. Again, when it comes back to that functional status, get moving. Uh, this surprises a lot of people, but usually after an organ transplant, like, they want you up and moving like almost the next day, uh, kind of walking around the hospital, uh, you know, getting moving is tolerated, getting your physical therapy into really, again, the more you get that movement in, so important to build that functional status back up. Long term, of course, we want to manage any health issues. So things like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, these are common things that a lot of us will have that can also be compounded by some of the immunosuppressant medications after a transplant. Continuing to keep our electrolytes within target range, really important. And then this is a question I get 
a lot, both when I worked in transplant um, and just in general, people always ask me like, what is the best diet? So I wanted to do another poll question. You know, what is the best diet for someone after an organ transplant? So I want you guys to give me your best answer for this one. I'm very interested to see the results. I think you guys might ace it, but I want to see what you guys say. It's always so interesting because there's so many different di like diets out there. And it's, it's just fascinating to me to see like what, what people are doing, what they like to do. Do you have the results, Rachel? Oh, yeah, very good. So yes, most of you guys. And 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 what I sometimes like to say with this, like there's not necessarily a wrong answer, uh, but the answer I would pick would be other. Because um, there really isn't, there's not one best diet for everyone after a transplant. I, I the, the blood type diet I threw in there, just I know with, with transplant, we, we in our mind, we always think of blood type because uh, that's such a big deal with getting a transplant, of course. Uh, but there really is not any long-term research showing that the, the blood type diet is necessarily one that is, you know, scientifically backed. Uh, something like keto or intermittent fasting, for some people, that might be a, a diet that works well for them. Uh, I will say with both keto and intermittent fasting, those are diets that I would say you would want to talk with your healthcare team about um, because those are also some diets that might not be great for some people. With something like keto, you know, it's it's very high protein, very high fat, uh, where if someone is having a lot of lipid issues, that probably wouldn't be a great diet for them. Um, something like intermittent fasting, there's actually some great research with it. Now, immediately post-transplant, would I want to intermittent fasting? Probably not. Um, but that's something that potentially, like if that worked for you and you know your, your doctors were on board with it, it could be something that might work for someone. Uh, with diabetes, you of course want to use caution with that because anytime you're not eating for a big chunk of your day, we worry about that blood sugar control. But I've seen, you know, there are some people diabetes that intermittent fasting works well for. But in general, like when we say like, what is the best diet for after a transplant? It's, it's what's the just best diet for you? I don't know why. I, I think sometimes after the poll, I have a hard time advancing my slide. Give me one second. There we go. So, you know, with a lot of times when we think of diet, again, it comes back to weight sometimes. And it's not all about weight, but really trying to find that healthy place for you. And, you know, weight management can be a challenge for everyone. You do see it a lot after a transplant, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Partly, hopefully, you're feeling better. Uh, you know, after a transplant, many times you, you're having a much less inflammatory state, especially once we get more into that healing process. Also, you may have less nauseousness. Uh, so that's a really good thing. The other thing you see a lot, for many people, you have less dietary restrictions. Uh, you still usually want to be careful with salt and, of course, just eating an overall healthy diet. But you may, you know, your electrolytes may be better controlled. Uh, you know, you might not have as much ascites or fluid retention. So oftentimes you're going to find that, hey, my, I feel better. I, I want to eat more. Uh, and so sometimes when we are able to eat more and there's more acceptable choices, it can lead to some weight gain. Uh, potentially, like, especially if you are taking any kind of steroids like prednisone, that especially, it can really affect your appetite a lot. Uh, so that may also, you see where people may have more weight gain if they are on long-term prednisone. Overall, like when I think of like, what is the the best diet. I sometimes hate that term, uh, but it, it, you know, it's, it's what is good for you. It's just overall healthy balance is what we're striving for. So a couple kind of tenets that I think go across many healthy eating plans, really focusing on fiber. Uh, one of the big benefits of fiber, it helps keep us full. So it, it sometimes prevents overeating. Uh, fiber also, it's got a lot of healthy things for our gut, things like prebiotics. Uh, generally, when you look at your fiber intake for most people, somewhere between 25 to 35 grams per day is indicated. Uh, 
And that's, that's quite a bit. I'll tell you that for a lot of people that can be a challenge. Uh, if you feel like you're not getting that amount of fiber, some great places to look for that are whole grains. So, you know, with breads, doing more whole wheat bread, look for ones that say 100% whole wheat. The sprouted grain breads can be really good too. Uh, also, just things like legumes, like your beans, uh, vegetables, fruits. You know, I'd always encourage you to, you know, from a fiber intake and also to to decrease the intake of added sugars, try to focus on like a whole fruit versus doing a fruit juice, for example. And then portion sizes, this is really key. Uh, everything has gotten bigger over the years. When you look at a, the average plate size in the 1970s compared to now, it's a lot a lot bigger. Uh, so definitely watching that portion can be a, a huge thing when we're looking at eating healthy. And then focus on real food. I think that's the other thing you see. Now, when you go to the grocery store, there's just so many more options. And we are live in a very convenient society. And a lot of your kind of more convenient foods do tend to be really processed. You look at things that have their ingredient list is like a mile long. Um, so trying to get more of the real food, less of the processed stuff is a really good thing for all of us. And again, moving more, uh, whether it's walking, uh, biking, swimming, yoga, whatever you like. So maybe even like set a step goal, whatever, or just maybe a certain amount of exercise minutes a day can be a really great thing for that overall healthy balance. So when it comes to protein long term, uh, this may change. So initially, postoperatively, again, we're we're you know most people are higher protein. As we get kind of in that long term health, you won't need like super duper high protein, usually long-term. So more moderate uh, because particularly with the immunosuppressant medications, many of them can affect our lipid levels, uh, whether it's your total cholesterol, your LDL, sometimes your triglycerides. So we do generally try to choose more of those lower fat protein options. Uh, so great choices can be things you know, if you're doing like ground beef or ground turkey, I would encourage you to try to find the ones that are at least 93% lean if you can. Uh, if you're buying something that's like a, a cut of meat, usually if it has the word loin or round in it, those are two key words that usually indicate um, a lower fat content. So those, you know, if you, like something like a pork loin, beef tenderloin, eye of round steak, those are going to be a little more on the lean side. So those can be better choices. Other things you can do uh, if you're, you know, getting turkey or chicken, uh, the most of the saturated fat that you see in that is in the skin. So if you take off the skin of your chicken or turkey, you can certainly save some. Uh, and I know sometimes it's hard. Like if you get like a rotisserie chicken that, that, that it's, you know, I know a lot of people like the skin of it. It doesn't mean you can't have any, but like trying to cut back on that and getting more of the actual chicken is a good thing. And the lighter meat chicken will be a little bit lower in saturated fat as well. Fish can be a great option for protein as well, uh, whether it's a fatty fish like salmon or, you know, a more leaner fish like tuna or mackerel, all can be great options. Uh, of course, with transplant, when we talk about food safety in a bit, you wouldn't want to do raw seafood. Uh, so something like raw oysters, I, I would avoid just because of the, 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 the worry about food safety. I'm a huge proponent also of those plant-based proteins. So things like your nuts, your beans are a great thing to incorporate in your diet. Uh, they also, again, have that fiber content, which also can be really helpful with cholesterol management. Yogurt, milk, you know, using some of those dairy products can also be a great source of protein and eggs and egg whites as well. Try to mainly utilize those heart healthy fats. So anything that's your, when you're looking at a food label, we would, Ideally, like things that have more monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fats versus the saturated or the trans fats, uh, particularly trans fats, like they've done a pretty good job of, you know, taking those out of a lot of foods. Um, but those are the, those are definitely the worst for us. But monounsaturated and polyunsaturated are great choices. Some of my favorite oils to cook with, olive oil, avocado oil. If you're doing something kind of maybe like an Asian stir fry, sesame oil is a wonderful choice. So those are all some really great choices. Kind of balancing your plate, uh, whether it's, it's not necessarily for weight loss. It may be more just for, again, that healthy balance. Uh, I'm trying to get about half your, your plate be fruits and vegetables. Your fruits and vegetables are such a wonderful source of nutrients, phytochemicals, prebiotics. Uh, so really, really healthy for us. 
Uh, if you do have diabetes or if you are maybe looking to, to kind of watch your weight, I would say try to do a heavier balance on the vegetables versus the fruits because the fruits are going to be a little bit higher in sugar naturally and calories. Uh, so veggies are our best friend. <laughs> so lots of good veggies. Uh, if you do, like when we talk about potassium in a bit, if you are someone that after a transplant does have to watch your potassium, just you would want to choose mostly those lower potassium vegetables. So something like green beans, carrots, cauliflower are some excellent choices. I try to drink, you know, again, mostly water for your beverages. Like, or, you know, if you do like unsweet teas can sometimes be a great option too, but water is always your best option. I'm a huge proponent in keeping a food diary. I know that sounds, and it's not necessarily, again, necessarily for weight loss. Uh, why? A couple of things, if you are looking to manage your weight, most people underestimate their, what we eat by at least a third. Um, so that's, sometimes just by writing it down, you can really track it better. The other thing I like with a food diary, particularly, I like, I, you know, you definitely can do like a regular like journal or a notebook, um, but I, I love like the different apps because it's all there. So if you you are tracking what you eat and then you're going to see your follow-up visit and say your blood sugar has been running a little high. It's so easy that you can pull it up and show your doctor or your dietitian what you're eating. And it's more probably accurate than you just thinking like, oh, what did I eat five days ago? I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember what I ate yesterday. Uh, so that, that app can be really helpful. So for those of you that are maybe a little technologically inclined, highly recommend it. Uh, and again, be mindful of beverages too. I know we sometimes don't think about that with what we drink. Like you go to Starbucks and you get whatever is the new fancy drink they have on their menu. And then you look it up. You're like, oh my gosh, that one drink had 400 calories in it and many, many grams of sugar. So it's always good to just be aware of that. And again, regular fitness long-term with the transplant, also excellent. Some of the things we talked about earlier, like using like a fitness watch or a pedometer to track your steps uh, or just increasing your volume. A couple apps I like, like something like a My Fitness Pal, or the one I use, I I like I use Lose It. I use the free version of it, and I just I love it because it really like incorporates exercise, incorporates what you're eating. It's just a really nice way so you can kind of see what you're doing, and and it also helps you remember what you ate a week ago when you're trying to remember that. <laughs> uh, so I always like that app. So it's a it's a it's a one of my favorites, and the free version is pretty extensive. So portion sizes. This is something I think I use this slide probably in a lot of presentations I do, because uh, I think this is something we all struggle with, knowing like what is a portion of something. Uh, so typically when we think of a portion of like, like meat, like chicken, fish, et cetera, usually about it's three ounces is what we consider a portion, which is about the size of a deck of cards. And a lot of us eat more than that. Um, and that's not not to say that you can't like a lot of people like a good portion for them might be five ounces for a meal. Uh, just kind of knowing that, but knowing what three ounces look like is a good thing. Dairy is about an ounce of cheese. So a little, four little dice. Um, it's, I find cheese is one of those things that's easy to eat more, more than one portion of sometimes. A half a cup, so for example, like half a cup of ice cream, about a half of a tennis ball. So that's a pretty small amount. Uh, so, you know, just kind of, again, sometimes you're going to eat more than one portion of some of these things, but just kind of recognizing what that portion looks like can be great. And then two tablespoons of something like peanut butter or mayo, about those two dice. One ounce of hard candy or nuts, about the size of a hard boiled egg. Some other ones, a bagel, about the size of a hockey puck. Most bagels are probably four or five times that size. Uh, I would say usually like your, your hockey puck size bagels are like the little mini bagels you can sometimes get at the grocery store. Uh, that's when I was talking about how big portions have gotten. That's a perfect example of it. A medium fruit about the size of a baseball. Perfect with my theme for today with the Orioles and baseball. Uh, so that's, I I always do this. I always sometimes like ball up my fist like when I'm thinking about a portion of fruit because uh, fruit's one of those things, very healthy, natural sugars, fiber. Uh, if you do struggle with particularly diabetes, fruit's got natural sugar in it. All fruit does. Uh, so that's something where if you were maybe accidentally eating much bigger portions of it, it could in fact impact your health in a negative way if you're eating too much. Uh, so that's a great way to just kind of visualize how much fruit to have. A medium potato about the size of a computer mouse. This one always gets me too. I feel like potatoes are usually much bigger than that. Uh, so just again, being mindful with that. Uh, tennis ball to kind of show you like a cup of fruit or like a, or like a cup of rice, pasta or cereal, just a great visual to kind of think about like, what does one cup look like? Uh, and then about 
a golf ball is about a third cup of dried fruit. So you can see that's one of the reasons a lot of times we we prefer fresh fruit to dried fruit because from a like a nutrition standpoint, when you you can see like you can have one cup versus one third cup of the dried fruit because the dried fruit it's the nutrients, particularly the sugar is going to be a lot more concentrated as well as the potassium. If you ever have to watch potassium, dried fruit is very very high in potassium. So just some low sodium guidelines, uh, just to kind of go through. This is something that for many people, even after a transplant you likely still are going to be, want to be mindful with sodium. Uh, if, if your doctor tells you to be on an actual low sodium diet, typically that's less than 2,000 milligrams a day. One thing that always gets me, you, you may know this already, but one teaspoon of table salt has 2,300 milligrams. Uh, so really trying to curb that added salt because that one little teaspoon, more than we need in a whole day. I've always liked this, like if you normally eat three meals a day, if you can keep most meals to 600 milligrams of sodium or less, you're going to do a terrific job with that. So that's, it still allows you a little wiggle room with things, but you can usually, I think it's easier to sometimes think about the sodium per meal versus that whole day. Utilize salt-free seasoning for flavor, things like your herbs, spices, pre-made mixes like Mrs. Dash. Uh, just if any of you are in a potassium restriction, I would avoid those with potassium chloride. Examples are something like new salt or my salt. Uh, and try to eat most meals at home. You have a lot more control of your sodium intake that way. Uh, if you do go out to eat, you know, if it's a chain restaurant, I always suggest Googling, you know, your restaurant with their nutrition so you can see, just make a healthier choice because some of the meals when you go out are exorbitantly high in sodium. Uh, also, you can never be afraid to ask them to not prepare them with salt. There'll still be salt, sodium in it, but it'll be less. And always read your labels. It's surprising where we see sodium. Uh, just to kind of show you a couple of things with the labels. Uh, the biggest thing, always start with the serving size because that's what that nutrition is based on. And a lot of foods... We sometimes eat more than one serving with something without realizing it. Uh, one example I see a lot, like a lot of like your crackers, snack food, something like Ritz crackers, the serving size is five crackers, where a lot of people eat more than that. Um, but they might just look at the label and say, oh, five crackers has, you know, 150 milligrams of sodium in it and kind of have that number stuck in their head. But if they ate 10 crackers, that's really 300 milligrams. So really important to incorporate that serving size. Something is considered to be low in sodium if it's 140 milligrams or less per serving. It's technically high in sodium if it's 400 milligrams or more. Uh, when you look at the labels, I, I you have to also always, always look at what the actual label says. Because sometimes on the front of a food, you may think that say, it might say reduced sodium or low sodium. That doesn't necessarily mean it is technically a low sodium food. Uh, food manufacturers are actually able to put low sodium on the front of a food if it's 30% less than the original version. Um, but many things are actually like the regular version so high in sodium that even the low sodium version is high. Uh, I find that the term no added salt is a much better predictor of something that's actually low in sodium. But with always read the labels, I have seen too, for some of you, if you have to watch your potassium, be mindful sometimes when it says low sodium or no added salt, double check the potassium content because sometimes some of those foods are using potassium chloride as that salt substitute. So just something to keep in mind. These are just some of my personal favorite low sodium seasonings. Um, you know, I am a big fan of a lot of the Mrs. Dash flavors. A couple of my favorites, I the one in the black cap, the, the chicken blend, so good. Um, and then I really like that a lot of people like the everything bagel seasonings have you know, been a big thing trend over the past couple of years. Mrs. Dash actually makes one of everything but the salt. So it's everything in the bagel seasoning, but they don't have the salt in it. Uh, really tasty. Uh, just good old fashioned garlic powder. I usually get mine at Aldi because it's super cheap. <laughs> uh, it can be a great option. And then I, I don't know if any of you guys have tried these. McCormick's has these new seasonings. They're called Hint of Salt. Uh, they are made with a tiny bit of the sea salt, but it's a small enough amount that it's still zero milligrams of sodium overall. And they're super, super flavorful. So two of my favorites there. Uh, with potassium, some of you, you know, potassium may be initially elevated post-transplant due to medications. Uh, it's also for those of you that are on tacrolimus as an immunosuppressant, if your levels of tacrolimus are running a little high, it can affect your potassium levels too. Um, so with some medicines, you may see that. So some people even, for example, with well-functioning organ transplant, their potassium may run a tiny bit high where you have to be more careful with it. And then those of you with kidney disease, uh, some of you pre-transplant also may have to focus. Focus on this.
some high potassium foods, bananas, tomatoes, oranges, potatoes, dried fruit are some examples. So you do have to watch your potassium better to focus on those lower potassium options. Things like berries, apples, cabbage, green beans are some good examples of low potassium fruits and veggies. And again, portion still matters with potassium too, just like with sodium, just like with calories, portion matters. So just an example of strawberries, which are considered a low potassium fruit, they are low potassium if you eat five of them. If you eat 25 strawberries, they're really high in potassium. So that's, that's just always something to keep in mind with any of those low and highs. It depends how much you have it. Just an example on the other end, tomatoes are a high potassium vegetable. If you're eating a slice of tomato, that's not necessarily that high in potassium. You know, that's something that if you love it, you could probably still fit it into the, your meal plan. So portion matters a lot. Uh, phosphorus, and, you know, is one of those things that also may be low after a transplant. Some good dietary sources of potassium or phosphorus, I should say, whole grains, beans, nuts and nut butters, dark sodas. I'm not, I'm not, I don't really usually push soda intake. Uh, you know, if someone's really struggling with it, that might be something we do. Uh, but usually we want more of like what we call the organic phosphorus. So the, the you know, the, the dairy, the beans, the nuts, the whole grains to help boost that phosphorus up. Um, if you have kidney disease, you know, that is something that you may have to limit before the transplant, you know, both if you're on dialysis or pre-dialysis, uh, particularly with that, you want to limit the, what we call the inorganic sources of phosphorus, which is phosphorus that's added to a food. So things like in your whole grains and beans and nuts, phosphorus is found naturally in, we absorb about 40% of that. When a food manufacturer adds phosphorus to say a diet Pepsi or some lunch meat, you're going to absorb 100% of that. And where you would see that on the ingredient list, if you ever see the word P-H-O-S, that's a phosphorus additive. So we would want to try to avoid that with kidney disease. Post-transplant, you likely will be able to be more liberal with that. But again, monitor your labs. Magnesium sometimes also can be low after a transplant. Uh, some people do require supplementation. You know, talk with your doctor. You know, they'll, they'll definitely monitor that. There's always a little kind of cost benefit because many, many magnesium supplements, sometimes some people will get a little diarrhea with them, which then you lose more magnesium. Um, a couple that I've seen used a lot are things like Mag Plus Pro, magnesium glyconate, uh, maybe easier tolerated. Uh, but again, see with your doctor. Sometimes just increasing it through your foods, you may be able to boost that up. And similar to phosphorus, magnesium is found in dairy, whole grains, beans, nuts, also your dark leafy greens, things like kale and collards are a great source of magnesium. Uh, diabetes after a transplant uh, is more common. Um, it's partly the medications. Uh, you see it's more prevalent in people that may be a little bit overweight, uh, older. Uh, also, you know, just you know, sometimes people that are in kid after a kidney transplant, they may have been kind of borderline with diabetes, but with the improved kidney function, you see insulin go through your body a lot more quickly. Uh, so sometimes they may seem that their blood sugars run a little higher. Uh, sometimes just losing a little bit of weight. If you are overweight, five to 10% of body weight may be effective at decreasing that insulin resistance. Moving after meals can help delay that blood sugar spike, but just consistent carbohydrate diet, whole grains, fiber, non-starchy vegetables are some of the keys if you are struggling with elevated blood sugars and work with your team. You know, often seeing like an endocrinologist or diabetes specialist can be a really good thing to help ensure that your blood sugars are well controlled because that's just a really important thing for overall health. So food safety, covering our bases. I'm back to my bad baseball analogies. Uh, this is really important because you're on immunosuppressant medication. So you are more susceptible to different opportunistic infections, uh, including foodborne illness. So some big guidelines, just cook your meats to the proper temperature, avoid raw or undercooked meat, seafood, eggs, things like sushi, ceviche, poke bowls, raw oysters are some things you really want to use caution with. Also in restaurants, some places like with their Caesar dressing will use raw eggs in that. So that would be something I'd always ask about. Washing your fruits and vegetables, uh, just the old adage, keep hot foods hot, cold foods cold, always a good one. If you are doing anything like hot dogs or lunch meats, you actually do want to like reheat them. Um, a lot of like your deli meats and hot dogs can grow things like listeria, which can be really dangerous for transplant patients. So just reheating them till they're steaming hot uh, and then having them would be a more food safe practice. 
buffets and salad bars, I would use caution with too. Just it's, you don't know like who's touching them with their hands, who's sneezing on them. Uh, might not necessarily be a, a dangerous thing, but just for, you know, just general viruses, just something I'd be more careful with. Uh, making sure dairy is pasteurized and avoiding unpasteurized juices and particularly apple cider you sometimes see in the fall is something I would avoid. Uh, so drug nutrient action uh, interactions, don't strike out on this. Uh, so avoid herbal supplements unless they are cleared by your doctor. And I always say, ask your pharmacist too. Uh, a couple of common ones that definitely have interactions with uh, immunosuppressant medications include St. John's wort, echinacea, ginseng, feverfew are some that I would definitely not take. Um, many herbal supplements can have interactions with other meds also, a lot of blood clotting issues. So again, that's a big deal. And and it's, I know a lot of times we're so programmed, we want things natural. Like we're so, especially when you're taking so many medicines, you kind of gravitate towards that. But with any kind of herbal supplements, I would always, always make sure you reach out to your team to make sure that that is something they feel comfortable with. Uh, the other thing with any kind of over-the-counter supplements, they're just, they're not standardized. There's sometimes limited research. So you just really want to make sure you're just not taking something without clearing it and making sure that your team is aware and comfortable with that. I would not take any creatine supplements that's sometimes used in like protein powders. Uh, you know, if someone's trying to gain muscle, sometimes they look for that, but I would not take that. Uh, and again, just any vitamin, mineral, herbal supplements, even something like you know, people are like, oh, vitamin D is good for me. Check with your doctor before you take extra vitamin D, you know, just to make sure, you know, that's something you actually need. You know, at, at worst, it's, you know, at best, it's a waste of money. At worst, it could really affect something else. So always clear anything over the counter. Uh, and also, you know, with products that contain sugar, alcohol, sometimes you'll see this in like protein bars and whatnot. Um, you just, you just, just be monitored if you see sugar, alcohol, the reason it's not dangerous per se, uh, but it can cause diarrhea. Um, so particularly if you are already, you know, having loose stools with some of your medicines, it could just be annoying. Uh, but it also sometimes could cause like your magnesium to drop. So just something to be aware of. Uh, some other ones to think about. Uh, you do see like grapefruit juice. Yeah. I just wanted to pop in to make sure we had enough time for Q&A. Yes. I'm almost done. I promise. Okay. <laughs> So just drug nutrient interactions like grapefruit juice, uh, pomegranate, Seville oranges, black licorice are some you want to avoid. And spices in large amounts like ginger and turmeric may affect levels of immunosuppressants. Usually if you're using a little ginger in a field, not a big deal, but not large quantities. And something like Fresca or Sunny D does have a little bit of grapefruit juice in it. So just some ideas, resources, hit a home run, uh, utilize your team, utilize your transplant dietitian, um, whether it's through meal planning, evaluating labs, tracking food, some of my favorite apps, I mentioned Lose It. For those of you with kidney disease, uh, My Joju is a great one. Schedule activity, put it on your calendar and work with your team. Uh, and there's just some additional resources, just some websites. Uh, so with that, let's go through questions. Thank you, Christine, for all that wonderful oh, information. Okay. What's that? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, we have a bunch of questions, so we'll try to get to okay. it. I said I couldn't hear you for a second, but now I can. <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, oh, good. So um, someone says, uh, Tisha says, many individuals who have ESRD or CKD do not have adequate access to social workers, dietitians, nor PT. How can we advocate for such services with our given clinics or with our physicians? This is a huge piece and increasingly so. That's a great question. So like with ESRD you know, in your dialysis clinic, all clinics are supposed to have a social worker and dietitian that are available to you. Uh, with everything in healthcare, I think especially since COVID, that staffing sometimes is suboptimal at times. Uh, if you are finding that you are not getting, you're not seeing your dietitian or social worker at your dialysis center to what you feel adequate enough, I'd be a squeaky wheel. I would say talk to your facility administrator, uh, talk to the nurse and say, I need to there. Even if you're, if you have a dietitian, for example, it's like out on maternity leave, there's someone that should be covering it. You might not see them as much, but if you are needing that, they should put you in contact with someone. So I would say just keep, keep asking about that. Uh, for those of you that are not on dialysis, um, 
you know, there are for Medicare covers, you know, visits with a dietitian if you're in stage three, four, or five. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find. I would say ask your doctor if they have a dietitian that they would recommend. Uh, you can also, like, if you just Google kidney dietitians in Maryland, there's a, often a list and you can, what I would always look for when you're looking for a dietitian specific to say kidney disease, if they say anything about their certified renal specialist, that's someone that's definitely has a, a higher level of training with kidney disease. So that is what I would look for. Thank you, Christine. Um, Eric asks, I've been cramping post-op. Will over-the-counter magnesium help alleviate? That's a great question. So, you know, post-op cramping, you know, can be a lot of the, the two biggest things that are going to affect that usually are low potassium or low magnesium. Uh, so that would be something I would say before taking anything over the counter, check with your doctor. I would see where your labs are. If it is potassium, you know, that's something they check routinely every time you get your blood work done. They don't always check magnesium. So if you are having cramping, I would check with a doctor just to see, you know, how is my magnesium? Uh, and, you know, again, you can try to get it through dietary sources, but you, you may, need supplements, but I would just definitely check with your doctor before taking anything over the counter. Okay. But magnesium question. can help with cramps. Good. <laughs> Next question from Lisa. Um, she says, we are dealing with a low sodium and low potassium diet. Is there a website that has a list of accurate foods slash meal ideas? That's a great question. So there are, there's a lot of the National Kidney Foundation is a great resource. Um, what I think is a frustration for a lot of people, particularly when it comes to potassium, is that your lists are going to look different. <laughs> you'll see on one website, you'll see broccoli says it's low potassium. Somewhere else, broccoli says it's high potassium. Every every resource may be slightly different in what they consider a low potassium food or their the portion may be different that they're looking at. Um, but the National Kidney Foundation is a really trusted resource and they have that information. Uh, KidneySmart.org has a lot of great information on it too. Uh, if you are pre-dialysis, if you, if, uh, uh, I, I teach the Kidney Smart class, so I should qualify that, but we, we have a class uh, and there's a lot of great information in the book that we give out does have a great list of sodium and potassium in it. So, so it's available online or, or in person. So that's another resource that I'm a big believer in. Okay. We have time for about one or two more questions. Um, Shannon asks, I struggle getting enough nutrients, especially protein post liver transplant 17 months. I'm an active 51 year old who works out pretty hard three to five days a week with weights and cardio. My kidneys are weakened by my immunosuppressive medications and have to be careful with protein intake. Any suggestions for better protein intake that might be a little more kidney friendly? There isn't really a team once you are one year out. Thank you. That's a great question. And I, you know, I think that, you know, it is, you see the the, the transplant team less and less. Uh, what I would say, like, I still would say, like, if you are over a year out when you're, you, you still have follow-up with your transplant. I think at that point with your doctor every once in a while, uh, I would say if you are having specific dietitian questions, ask them, can I, can I see the dietitian again? Or maybe even it's something you can talk on the phone, but as far as better protein choices, I would focus more on like, if when you have a little bit of like your kidneys are a little weaker, your plant-based proteins. So like your nuts, your beans, um, also chicken and fish, eggs and egg whites are some ones that are going to be a little easier in the kidneys, not as much of the red meat, red meat and processed meats are going to be a little bit harder on a decreased kidney function. So I would focus more on those plant-based. So if you're needing more protein, even like if you needed to do like with workouts, maybe like a a plant-based protein supplement and almond milk to make an easy shake. If you need to get a little bit of that plant-based protein in, if you're struggling, sometimes drinking is easier than eating the protein at times. Uh, but I would definitely, if you're, I, I always, I hate when people are like longer term after their transplant and feel they don't have someone to reach out to. So talk with your nurse coordinator or your doctor and say, Hey, I, I have, I need to talk with the dietitian again. Uh, they, they should be able to connect you with them. Thank you, Christine. Okay, so we are going to wrap up, but I want to thank you again for all of your time and your insight. Um, for everyone who's here, the next session begins at 11.45 um, Eastern time. And um, remember to check the event website for the Zoom links for the next session. And um, some people have been asking about session recordings. I just want everyone to... Um, know that all of our sessions will be recorded. You will receive all of those through the Eventbrite link um, where you registered with that email. So um, if you missed a session or wanted to attend the other one, you can, you'll have all of that information. All right. Well, thank you, Christine.
That's You're so time. welcome. Thank you, everybody. I'm trying to answer some questions in the chat real fast. <laughs> okay. I'll leave it open for another minute while you do that. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah.